So, Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, Senator Fasano, Representative Claritas, members of the General Assembly, fellow state officials, Lieutenant Governor Bysowitz, honored guests, and the people of the great state of Connecticut. Today, I'm presenting you a budget which gives us the best chance to get our state growing again. Connecticut has been a jobs laggard for many, many years, which depresses opportunity and hits our budget every year. And if we had grown jobs at the same rate as our other states, we'd be talking about how to invest our surplus, our cut our taxes, instead of staring down the barrel of a $3.7 billion deficit over a new every budget cycle. <laughs> I will not allow this budget to be another scene from Groundhog Day, where I come to you year after year, hat in hand, lamenting the fact that we still haven't addressed our structural deficits. The fiscal crisis before us is not just a short-term hole in the budget. We're digging that hole deeper every year, four to five hundred million dollars annually, due to fixed costs such as pension, retiree health care, bonded debt, all growing faster than our economy. And most of these fixed costs pay for the past rather than investing in our future. Fixed costs inherited from the past consume nearly a third of Connecticut's budget, much more than our peers. That hurts our ability to make investments in our future, putting us at an enormous competitive disadvantage. And I can't fix this chronically broken budget without each and every one of you. The legislature is a co-equal branch of government, and I need you at the table, helping me to explain the business and labor, our mayors, our boards of education, and most importantly, our taxpayers, what we are doing and why. And where we differ, don't hold a press conference. Come talk to me. Take a breath. Suggest a better alternative. And the numbers must add up. We just celebrated George Washington's birthday. Okay. You never know. So we just celebrated George Washington's birthday, and I promise you this is my last Hamilton analogy, so help me God. But George Washington, <laughs> I got applause. But George Washington. Uh, tells young Alexander Hamilton, winning is easy, young man, and governing is harder. And let's prove them wrong. Let's try a different type of politics. And let's not wait for the summer to do it. Loudly from all across the state, I heard the same thing from our local leaders. Ned, I'm willing to live within our means. I can tighten our belt, but I need to know what those means are so I can plan accordingly. So look, if you hate my proposal today, don't wait till June to tell me what to do. Let's sit down tomorrow and get to yes, sooner rather than later. When it comes to balancing this budget, my urgent priority is stabilizing the teacher's pension fund. It's not just... <laughs> okay, it's badly underfunded. It doesn't keep faith with our current teachers, especially the younger teachers. And the state compounded that problem maybe a decade ago by layering on a pension obligation bond, which, let me put this gently, didn't quite work out the way we may have hoped. And now let me be blunt. If we don't fix this bond, our current payment plan could have disastrous consequences. Our annual contribution to the teachers' retirement fund could end up being higher the amount the state pays on education across the state. So working closely with Treasurer Sean Wooden, we'll restructure our pension contributions there. This will reduce our annual payments, reduce our financial risk, and give the teachers the confidence that their pension will be there when they need it. We're also going to assume a much more conservative and realistic rate of return assumption. Similarly, the state employee plan still represents a large share of the overall budget and accelerates state payments at $100 million every year. And that's an unacceptably high cost, which could either force draconian cuts to
to needed services or a large tax increase. So again, working with the Treasurer and our friends in labor, we want to smooth out those payments on both of those pension systems so that our annual contributions is a lower percentage of our budget over the next generation. This is similar to what you do in a pinch with your own home mortgage. And to those of you who say, this sounds like we're just stretching out these mortgage-like payments over a longer period of time, we're just kicking the can, I, I got to tell you that this is a crisis that's been generations in the making. And it's going to take a while to work our way out of this. We need the breathing room to maintain our current commitments in education and transportation and workforce development. And we need to provide stability for our towns and cities some of which are struggling with insolvency issues of their own. In addition, we must slow the rate of increase in our pension obligations and tie future cost of living increases to the performance of the pension fund. And when markets perform well, the cost of living adjustment goes up. And when markets are down, the COLA is a little less generous. Our teachers are already on this track. But this is a required tough negotiations, and we've got to start. These pension reforms, they don't solve for world peace. They're just a start. But they offer a reasonable basis for long-term fiscal stability and building business and consumer confidence, which is a precondition to getting our state growing again. The next big structural reform focuses on health care, specifically our state employee and retiree health care. The state of Connecticut provides health care coverage for 200,000 individuals. Let me be clear. We are not taking away anybody's health care. A deal is a deal. But our health care costs are growing much faster than our economy meaning that we have to do a better job of controlling costs if we're to continue investing in our future. Controller Limbo and our team are working with our state employees to forge a path where the state no longer pays whatever a health care provider charges us, but instead we set a ceiling on the maximum price that the state will pay. And we've looked at this. Kevin and I, there's not a real direct correlation between the quality of care and costs, and the costs for these medical procedures are all over the map. So listening to our friends in labor, we're also going to build upon the state's smart shopper program. What that means is we provide cash incentives to our state employees for selecting quality, cost-effective health services. So our employees will receive quality and more affordable health care, and the state will pay less. I want to make one important personal point. To those of you who believe that we're not asking enough of the state employees, just remember that these are the folks that work their heart out for each and every one of us every day. They're taking care of our kids, they're taking care of our parents, they're keeping us safe, they're fixing our roads. And they have a contract that extends till 2027. And I'm asking them to sit down now together in good faith, and we're talking because you all care about the future of our state, and I thank you for that. Some of the old pros here, they've suggested I should hold off on these discussions for a few years when I'll have more leverage, the threat of layoffs to propel a negotiation. Forget it. We can't afford to wait two years. And frankly, threatening to lay off our newest state employees who are doing important work, that's not the way I negotiate and that's not the way I treat people. <laughs> I also know that there are tens of thousands of our state employees who are going to be retiring over the next three to four years. And I have to work to plan for that. And how we work together to fix our long-term pension and health care costs or will impact my thinking on the mix of state employees and outside providers 
in our government's future. Some of you think that Connecticut needs a Wisconsin moment where we walk away from collective bargaining and tear up our contracts. I want an anti-Wisconsin moment. I want a Connecticut moment. I want a Connecticut moment where we show that collective bargaining works, not just for retirees, but for our next generation of state employees and the next generation of taxpayers. We can make this work. Okay, next portion of our fixed cost that drives up our structural deficits, bonded debt. Over the last eight years, our bond authorizations have skyrocketed. In fairness, we made some important capital investments and some nice-to-have investments. But the payback of principal plus interest is consuming more and more of our budget. Our budget, my budget, reduces bonding authorizations by nearly $600 million a year. It will greatly reduce the cost of our fixed debt going forward. And I've talked to a lot of you. I know you agree in principle, but then you generally have one more special project that's in the queue in my district. So be forewarned. If it's not tied to workforce and economic development or cost-saving shared services, Connecticut is on a debt diet, and I'm going to make sure we stick to that plan. Memo to self, crickets. <laughs> All right, while I'm at it, we here in this room have also got to do our part to reduce these fixed costs. And I recognize that some of you are proposing bills whereby your mileage allowance would no longer be rolled into your pension base. Thank you for taking the initiative. When passed, I will sign that bill. Kind of a mixed reaction. <laughs> on the operating side of the budget now, we're cutting back on middle management. And I asked my commissioners for some ideas to cut costs and make their departments even more efficient. Some great ideas came from the top. Commissioner Jim Ravella, public safety. He suggested replacing state trooper auto fleet every five or six years, not instead of four. And putting civilians on desk jobs to allow more state troopers to do what they do best protect Connecticut and me. <laughs> the DMV, Department of Motor Vehicles, you're not going to need to get your license or registration renewed quite as often. And we're also going to move these transactions online, not in line. <laughs> Going forward, we're also going to look at the cost and frequency of licensing for the trades and other professions, providing additional savings for folks in small business. We have a new leader at the Department of Administrative Services, Josh Jabal, who spent 11 years at IBM. I have proposed a significant investment in technology and IT personnel to modernize and digitize state government. Moving transactions from manual to online can reduce costs by north of 75%. Today, we have probably 2,000 plus forms that people fill out, and less than 5% of them can be completed online. So as we digitize interactions, we'll achieve cost savings, a better customer experience, and you'll see those savings reflected in my next budget. Thank you. And we expect transparency from our state agencies. Well, I demand it from our quasi-public agencies as well, such as the lottery. I propose legislation will, that will ensure we have access to their books and their bottom line. Taxpayers expect nothing less. Okay, I can still hear it. 
Come on, Governor, cut more. Cut more now. I come from business. But unlike business, I can't just say to patients on the road to recovery at the Department of Mental Health or to kids in crisis at DCF, I can't pay the bills. I can't tell the elderly that there's no room at the inn. I can't simply shut down an underperforming department. But we can and must provide better service at lower cost, but more efficient and more responsive state government, and that starts now. All right, now over to the revenue side. Because I refuse to pour money into a leaky bucket, I've led with the structural changes to give us the best chance to stabilize our escalating fixed costs. And I have not proposed raising the income tax rate, which has been raised five times over the last 15 years with diminishing returns. And I'm not proposing an increase in the sales tax rate, because I believe we have to reform our sales tax for the 21st century. And what do I mean by that? Our current sales tax is designed for a Sears Roebuck economy, driven by over-the-counter sales. Today we live in an Amazon economy, which is driven by e-commerce, digital downloads, consumer services. So my sales tax reform proposal would broaden the base so the digital goods are treated equally and more, succeed, and more significantly that we are capturing a growing segment of the economy. For example, movie theaters charge a tax. Why should Netflix be treated the same? And under our budget proposal, oh, Netflix subscriber. <laughs> Under our budget proposal, consumer-oriented services will no longer be tax-exempt. And it's so erratic. I mean, why do you have to pay a tax on manicure and you don't pay a sales tax on a haircut? So expansion of the base helps to make the sales tax more robust, fairer, and raises the revenue we need to get our budget into balance. And believe me, I've been forewarned by all of you, this, there was bipartisan consensus on this, that every tax expenditure has a strong lobby behind it and the pushback will be ferocious. All right, so if you find the haircut lobby pretty persuasive, we have an amazing uh, head of OPM, Melissa McCall, who you, some of you heard from today, and we'll model out. Hey, that got something. And she will model it out. <laughs> She'll model out how we can expand the base and reduce the rate or narrow the base and expand and, and raise the rate. I'm going to work this with you. And Melissa is nonstop. The only reason she leaves the OPM building is because the security guards kick her out at 11 p.m. and that's because I won't pay for any more overtime. <laughs> All right, so I welcome you to this debate. And if you disagree, have at it. But again, the numbers must add up at the end of the day. Under our budget proposals, we're making a commitment to education. While some towns that are losing stop population will receive a little less, other towns with growing population and more kids in need will see more investment. In addition, many of our school districts have chosen to pay their teachers much more than the state median. It's a great investment for their community. But it's an investment that impacts the state's overall pension obligation. So our budget will ask every municipality to make a contribution towards normal teacher costs. But towns like mine, Greenwich, which pay teachers about 30% more than the statewide average, they're going to be asked to pay that extra amount as well into the pensions. This reform, <laughs> this reform ensures that municipalities have some skin in the game and the pension burden is shared more fairly. One big priority for me on a personal basis, recruiting more teachers to our tougher schools, reaching out to more teachers of color and more male teachers 
And we do this by being bolder on the incentives we pro provide to teach in those schools, such as tuition reimbursement and down payment assistance programs. Our children benefit from role models and mentors they can look up to. And this is one big step towards closing the opportunity gap. While we're holding the line on operating costs and bonding, larger schools and districts which pool resources, sharing superintendents, sharing back office functions, they'll receive priority for new bonding. Let's incentivize smart choices and strategic decisions. I prioritize education as the opportunity engine for all of our young people. It's the key to workforce development, assuring also that our businesses, large and small, have the talent they need to grow in the future. And I'm asking everybody to do a little bit more in this budget, and that includes business. In my proposed budget, business isn't going to get the elimination of the 10% surcharge that they were expecting this year. But I am proposing to eliminate the business entity tax, which is a costly nuisance, especially for our small businesses. And I'm inviting Connecticut businesses to step up and partner with me to help the next generation of talent repay their student loans and save for their futures. So to kickstart this effort, Travelers Insurance, Stanley Black & Decker have agreed to offer their own loan forgiveness programs. And together we're inviting other companies to join them. Help us train and attract and retain top talent in our state and make it affordable. Make education affordable. Thank you. Another way to drive economic development to our urban centers and distressed communities is to take advantage of the new federal opportunity zones. I want Connecticut to be one of the first states out of the box on this. By lining our existing state resources to provide that targeted um, support, we can invest tax-free in these areas, creating good-paying jobs for folks that need it the most. And I'm sitting down with legislative leadership now, along with our hospitals, to restart a more collaborative co conversation with our hospitals about their role in ensuring Connecticut's physical health and fiscal health. But we all know that workforce development can't happen without our state's working families. Many households in the 21st century either have two working parents or a single parent juggling multiple responsibilities, including caring for infants or the elderly. A $15 minimum wage enacted responsibly and over time will raise wages for almost a third of our workforce, a third of whom are female workers. 40% are African American, half are Hispanic. Let's give them a shot. <laughs> and passing, while well, I'm at it, passing paid family and medical leave program will ensure that workers <laughs> that will ensure that workers who need time to off for a new baby or recovering from an illness are not punished financially, and businesses do not risk losing good workers due to these emergencies. My budget also supports fully funding our clean energy and energy efficiency programs. They've been shortchanged over the last few years, 
And these funds help bring down electricity costs for working families, and they further reduce our carbon footprint. And I will make sure that we work with labor and our Votex schools so that more of our citizens, young and not so young, get the skills training they need for these good paying green collar jobs. All right, so in addition to bringing our workplace and our workforce into the 21st century, we must bring our transportation system into the 21st century. By That's the easy part. We do that by speeding up our highways and rail service, which are critical to the long-term economic growth of this state. Uh, okay. But it is a budget address. And now we got to talk about how we pay for it. Let me say this to everyone. People in the state are getting squeezed. The middle class is getting hammered. I saw that every day during the campaign. I see that every day as your governor. I know this idea of tolling just sounds like one more damn tax I'm going to have to pay. And I cannot fix this state unless I fix our transportation system. And let me tell you how I plan to do it. By now, you've heard that I'm submitting more than one option when it comes to tolling. Tolling for trucks only, and tolling for trucks as well as cars. And I've asked Transportation Commissioner Joe Gilletti, in either case, to make sure that we are streamlining the administrative and construction costs per mile. And we explore public-private partnerships to maximize the value of these new revenue streams. And in these partnerships, I can assure you that the public doesn't carry all the downside risk while the private investors enjoy the upside. We're going to get this done. I've supported, as you know, truck-only toll, truck tolling, which we thought could generate probably $200 million a year, uh, measured off the Rhode Island example. And if applied to all of Connecticut's major highways, it would. But while we're waiting the final ruling out of the Rhode Island case, our, our attorneys are saying probably in all likelihood, if they allow truck-only tolling, it will be only tolling on those bridges that are being rebuilt. Assuming that is correct, truck-only tolling could provide a small down payment on repairing our roads and bridges but not nearly enough to rebuild our transportation system, and certainly not without additional revenues. So let me be clear. I do not support raising the gasoline tax as an additional revenue. And some of you have suggested, how about we use something called priority bonding? I don't like that idea. It runs counter to our debt diet, and after 40 years of underinvesting in our transportation system, we cannot borrow our way out of this mess. <laughs> All right, so I know there are proposals in the legislature that call for tolling of cars and trucks. And I would only consider this option if we maximize the discount for Connecticut Easy Pass users and offer a frequent driver discount for those who require a frequent use of our major roadways. And by the way, it is estimated that over 40% of tolling revenue would come from out-of-staters. We foot the bill and we drive through their neighboring states. It's time for those out-of-state drivers to help foot the bill for fixing our roads and bridges. All right, you're the co-equal branch of government. I'm open to a real discussion with you, as well as Connecticut drivers, about the state of our transportation system and what is needed going forward, not only to make the repairs, but to truly put Connecticut on the path to speedier transportation. If the situation weren't as dire as it is, we wouldn't be having this conversation, and we got to do it. Speeding up our rail service from Hartford, New Haven, Stanford to New York City with more frequent service to Waterbury, New London, with easier access to Bradley Airport and an upgraded Tweed Airport, working collaboratively with the neighbors there. Make sure it benefits everyone. 
all while moving some drivers from roads to rail, incentivizing trucks to a go off peak. These are the transportation upgrades that are the building blocks of our economic future, and they have to start now. I recently announced the um, revitalized economic development team, and the first question they'll be asked by any employer thinking about expanding here in the state or moving their enterprise here to Connecticut, they ask, I hear your transportation system's in gridlock. How are you addressing that? And rather than nervously looking down at their shoes or checking their watch, our economic development team will now be able to say, I'm glad you asked me that. And they're going to say, well, how about those unfunded liabilities and those deficits? Our team will soon be able to answer, I'm glad you asked me that. How do you make sure that you have the workforce you need to grow and expand? I'm glad you asked me that. And beyond this two-year budget, we must enact new sources of revenues, such as sports betting, internet wagering, Legalize recreational marijuana like our neighbors that will be carefully regulated for a safer market with tax. <laughs> Young guys are standing up. And by year three, we're going to see more savings from all those investments in our new digital systems and online delivery. These are the building blocks of a balanced budget in the future. In the meantime, now, this current budget keeps faith with our cities, but not at the expense of our towns. It maintains our commitment to education and provides property tax relief. It's a budget that tackles our long-term fixed costs head-on and asks all stakeholders to be part of the solution. It's a budget that focuses on a 21st century workforce an economy and transportation system that reminds businesses why they want to be here in Connecticut. And it's a budget that supports businesses and working families alike. It's a budget that presents a path forward for our great state. And it does all this without raising tax rates on income or sales. But imagine what we could do if we could get this state growing again. Look, I've been an entrepreneur all my life. We start businesses, we grow the top line, we expand. And increasing the top line allows us to do more and dream big. And together, we can take this fiscal challenge, turn it on its head, and use it as a wake-up call to jumpstart our economy, an economy that works for everyone, that grows revenues we need to continue investing in our amazing future. All right, so last month I came before you. I think I'm a straight shooter. I think I'm an honest broker. I think I'm a pretty good listener. And the budget I proposed, I know, is far from perfect. And I welcome your input. The politics in Washington, D.C. right now is a dysfunctional mess. Let's show that here in Connecticut, we can work together on an honest budget, on time, one that gets this state moving again. And when we disagree, you don't go to the microphone, come to my office, let's talk, the door is open, let's get it done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Look, it's tough. It's going to be tough. But we're going to do this together. And it's going to be a budget that's on time. You know, born on a chilly February afternoon, maybe completed in time for a warm spring day. Why not? Certainly in time, I hope, for most of our mayors and our first selectmen, our superintendents, small businesses, all of our citizens alike, to plan for a fresh start. Now let's get to work. Thank you all.